Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very final episode of Species Shorts. Um, for those of you who are just joining us for our very last episode, my name is Lindsay Barone. For those of you who have been with me for this whole thing, welcome back. Thanks for sticking it through, um, and I'm glad you've enjoyed yourselves. Now, in today's episode, we have finally reached our own species. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the basics of our species, Homo sapiens. I would like you to take a look at some different specimens of Homo sapiens, both completely modern and something from the fossil record. And then I'd like to just talk a little bit about what it means to be human. So how do we define humanity? Um, what kinds of things are we looking for in the fossil record? and what kinds of behavioral things become a factor as well. So to kick things off today, I would like you all to take a look at a modern human skull. So here is our human skull. Take a look at its face. Think about a lot of the different features we've talked about over the course of this class. Take a look at the eyebrows, those brow ridge areas, Take a look at the nose and the projecting nasal aperture. There are those nasal bones we've been talking about a little bit. Um, look at how, from the side, the face is pretty flat. So we're losing that facial prognathism that a lot of the other hominins have. Another thing you can look at from the bottom of the skull is the position of that frame and magnum, which you can see that nice big hole right there. And then, of course, this is the face over here. This is the back of the skull. And I'm going to turn it this way so you can get a good look at the teeth. Now, we've talked a little bit about how the shape of the jaw actually changes, and it goes from being more of a U shape with parallel rows of teeth to something that looks more parabolic. So it gets wider as you move back further in the jaw. And that is exactly what we're seeing on this modern human skull. Um, here's the top of the skull, so you can take a look at that. You know, there's no sagittal keel, there's no sagittal crest. It's this nice, smooth, rounded skull that we see in most human skulls. And then, of course, I've got a jawbone here as well. So here's the mandible, and you can see that same pattern. Actually, I'll flip it so you're looking at it in the same way. Um, see how it's getting wider? As you move back, it's got a nice, relatively slender, petite jaw, um, and something that we haven't talked much about, but this guy has a chin. And chins are one of these sort of weird human things that there are a lot of hypotheses as to why they evolved, um, but what we know for certain is that we don't see this in other hominin species. So the presence of a chin is a very uniquely human thing. Um, and in fact, I have the Neanderthal jaw right here. Um, so this is from the old men of La Chapelle that we talked about in our last episode. Um, and you can see, pretty smooth. There's not much of a, a chin there at all. But on this guy, he's got a nice bumpy chin. So that's a uniquely human trait as well. Now, this guy, this is a, a replica of a relatively recent individual. I want you, though, to take a look at one that's a little bit older. Um, so this right here looks quite a bit different. But in fact, this is also a member of our species. This is a Homo sapien skull from a site in Ethiopia called Herto. Um, this particular skull dates to about 160,000 years ago. Now, if you've been watching all of our episodes, you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, that looks really similar to some of those archaic Homo sapiens. So, for example, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, um, they all have these sort of big, beefier skulls. Um, some have argued that the hair toe skull represents actually a subspecies of modern Homo sapiens. Um, the scientific name they use for that is Homo sapiens edelitu, uh, which basically means Homo sapiens, the elder, the root. Um, so saying that this is 
effectively the direct ancestor of modern living people. Other anthropologists have argued that uh, maybe this is not a subspecies, maybe it just represents some degree of modern human variation and that we shouldn't mess with the subspecies designation at all and just call this Homo sapiens. You know, it's up to you guys to make up your own minds what you think about this. Um, but I do want you to take a look at some of the characteristics that we just talked about with this other skull. So for example, take a look at the brow ridge. It's a little bit harder to see because it's so dark, um, but you know, look at how big and beefy that is. Take a look at the nose. Look at that projecting nasal bone and that big wide nose. Look at the cheekbones. Actually, I'm gonna turn it, oh, shoot. It's a little hard to see because of the lighting, but it's a much thicker, bigger cheekbone area than what we saw in that previous skull. But we also see a lot of the same kinds of characteristics as well. So for example, that parabolic tooth row, we see that here as well. Um, we've got that nice smooth cranium, so there's no evidence of a sagittal keel or a sagittal crest. It looks more or less what we would expect to see in a modern human skull. So how old is our species anyway? Well, the oldest known fossils in the hominin fossil record that have been assigned to our species are just over 300,000 years old. And if you follow anthropology at all, you may remember when they published on these fossils, um, they were found at a site in Morocco in the last five years or so, I believe, or at least the paper was published in the last five years. So that pushed back our previous understanding of how old our species was. Before that, the traditional wisdom was that our species was probably closer to 200,000 years old. So with that one find of a few fossils, that pushed back the age of our species even further, which is, I think, a really interesting thing. Now, what kinds of physical characteristics define our species? So we've talked about a couple of them already. Um, having a chin is notable, having a projecting nasal bone. So remember this top part of your nose, that's the bone. That's something that's a little bit unique among the hominins. We have relatively large brains. The average brain size for a modern Homo sapien is approximately 1,350 cubic centimeters. So that's a pretty large brain. It's also a pretty advanced brain. So there are, as we know, some advanced cognitive capabilities that come along with the human brain. We are good at spatial reasoning. Language is an important cognitive capability that comes along with our larger, more advanced brains. We have a better sense of place. We have a better sense of communal interaction. Um, so we're able to interact with and remember large groups of people. Some have argued that we can be close with up to 150 individuals. So we have a lot of really advanced capabilities. And that's to say nothing of the more cultural capabilities that come along with being a modern human. So advanced tool making, the construction of art and jewelry, we see clothing, shelter, eventually the domestication of plants and animals for agricultural purposes. There are a wide variety of cognitive abilities that we see firmly established in our species pretty early on. So we've got all of these abilities to interact with our environment, we've got abilities to survive and thrive in harsh environments, and in fact that is what we see. We have talked about a number of hominin species over the last few weeks, most of them never leave Africa. Many of them are pretty geographically isolated. So they are in one area of the world and they don't really go far. But our species has this sort of innate drive to explore. And I would argue that that is one of the reasons that has propelled our species not only out of Africa, but into more remote parts of the world that were maybe a little bit more inaccessible to the earlier hominins. So for example, Australia, we have people in that area of the world by 40,000 years ago. We've got people in Europe, Asia, 
People eventually make their way into North and South America. And then arguably, you could also say that people are in Antarctica as well. Although that's certainly a, a much more recent phenomenon. Certainly 10,000 years ago, people were not living in Antarctica. There wasn't really any evidence that there's ever been any human habitation down there. So our species is very unique in this ability to go out and explore. But what unifies us with the primates? So we have a lot of characteristics that are exactly what we would expect to see in a primate. We have large brain to body size ratios. We have opposable thumbs. So remember, we might have talked about this a little bit in the very first episode. Having an opposable thumb is something that most of the primates have. We have um, a preference. Well, I guess preference isn't the word to use. We have evolved to rely more heavily on our sense of sight rather than our sense of smell. That's something that we see with, um, with all of the primates. We also tend to live in different kinds of social groups. We tend to interact with a lot of different individuals. We tend to have longer childhoods. So we remain with our primary parent a little bit longer before we're sent off into the world um, on our own. And that certainly is true of all of the primates. And of course, we are placental mammals. So we are not gestated outside of a placenta. We're not in an egg that's hatched. Uh, we are attached to our placenta by an umbilical cord, and that's how our mother, when we are gestating, transmits nutrition. So all of these characteristics are things that help lump us in with the rest of the primates. So as you can see, we actually fit in really nicely with the rest of the primates. Now, we've been talking over the last few weeks about the hominins, and they are very closely related to us in a number of ways. But with the exception of anatomically modern humans, all of the other hominins are extinct. So how do we fit in with the living world? Well, our closest living relatives belong to the genus Pan. So that's Pan troglodytes, which are chimpanzees, and Pan paniscus, which are bonobos. Um, and bonobos and chimpanzees are very closely related. It, unless you're an expert, it can sometimes be a little bit tricky to even tell them apart. So we have very close living relatives in the world today. We had even closer living relatives that have gone extinct. And the question really becomes, why did they go extinct and why were we the ones to survive? And there's no answer to that. So that's the note I want to leave you with today, especially in light of everything that's going on in terms of climate change and the COVID-19 situation currently. Why were we the ones to not go extinct? Will we ever go extinct? What can we do to better ensure our survival? And there aren't answers to these. These are just rhetorical questions for you to think about. Um, you could certainly put your, your thoughts on these questions in the comments on this video. But I do want you to think about that over the next few days, few weeks, as long as this uh, stay at home order is in effect in your particular place in the world. Um, You've probably got some time on your hands. So just, you know, think this over, mull this over. It could be a good dinner time conversation topic if you really wanted it to be. Anyway, um, that is all I have for you all today. Thank you so much for joining me over the last few weeks. I hope you found this interesting. If you have any questions, any comments, please put them in the comments on the video. Otherwise, have a great day and stay safe and healthy.